Hey everyone, hope you're well. My name's Ben and thanks for joining me. Today I want to go over a few stories I've seen throughout the week. We'll be touching on stories around J&J &J and AstraZeneca with COVID issues, as well as a little bit of news around Disney. And we'll finish off with a sprinkling of cannabis just before we move into the portfolio update. So we should be in a nice chill mood. Now, the first story that I wanted to go over is around AstraZeneca and also Johnson & Johnson, who seem to have had an issue with one of their manufacturing partners in relation to the COVID vaccine. It seems that both AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson use the same facility for manufacturing their COVID vaccines in a plant in Baltimore owned by Emergent Biosolutions. The issue they seem to have encountered is the plant has somehow mixed up ingredients between the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, which has caused an estimated 15 million doses to be contaminated and therefore wasted. Due to this, the Biden administration have put a measure in place that will ensure that Johnson & Johnson have the right to the only vaccine produced in that plant, which to me makes sense because I'm pretty sure the AstraZeneca vaccine isn't yet available for use and the Johnson & Johnson one is. As we know, the US government are pushing quite hard on the vaccine rollout and there are now concerns that this information may potentially reduce some of the confidence that the public have in the vaccines, even though the vaccine has been stopped by the FDA on being released. However, what I find slightly odd that is that the FDA commissioner, Dr. Janet Woodcock, gave a statement saying, it is important to note that even when companies use contract manufacturing organizations, it is ultimately the responsibility of the company that holds the emergency use authorization to ensure that the quality standards of the FDA are met. This does slightly confuse me because they want large public confidence in the system and in the vaccine, but then they turn around and say it's completely the company's responsibility to ensure that the product meets their requirements. I'm not sure why this is. In my opinion, if they wanted mass confidence, they would be saying that they are monitoring the situation, which is why they caught this. But overall, it's not particularly good news that a large amount of COVID vaccines have essentially been wasted and hopefully thrown in the bin. Concerningly, it seems that this isn't the first time something like this has happened at this particular plant. And this company that owns the plant also produces things like the anthrax vaccine. But on a nicer note, let's move over to a story and article around Disney, who seem to be hot on the heels of the streaming giant Netflix. A recent review in subscriber loyalty undertaken by Hub Data shows that around 77% of Disney Plus users are likely to keep Disney Plus ongoing into the future. And the same review also showed that this is an improvement over Netflix, who only scored around a 73% chance of customers keeping the service. We have to remember that Disney Plus has actually only been around for 18 to 24 months, compared to Netflix, who announced that they were starting video streaming in around 2007. At the end of 2020, Netflix had around 204 million paid subscribers, with Disney having around 95 million users. So Disney have been able to essentially pull in nearly half of the current Netflix users in less than two years. For reference, it took about four years for Netflix to grow from 35 million to 94 million from 2013 to 2017. I appreciate that when Netflix were growing, it was a completely different time and Disney were essentially jumping on the bandwagon after streaming is already widely popular. But it is good to see that they've been able to grow so quickly and in theory keep the subscribers that they've been able to grow and get. So it's worth keeping an eye on as it took Netflix about three years to grow from 95 million subscribers to 200 million subscribers. And if Disney can keep this going and this growth rate going on their subscriber count, we could potentially see them reach Netflix levels of subscriptions in the next 18 to 24 months. And it would be really interesting to see how they get these subscribers. Perhaps they just ask, they just ask people to subscribe. And I'm sure if they have a like button, they would ask people to smash the like button. For the final story before the update, I wanted to go over a quick article that I've read around British American Tobacco, who seem to have purchased around 20% of the available shares in Organigram, who are a Canada licensed producer of cannabis products. They focus on producing indoor growth cannabis for patients and also for adult recreational use. There have been a clear jump in their share price over this period of time. They started from less than $2 a share, 
peaking at about $6 a share and have dropped and settled around $3.5 a share as of the 1st of April. I quite like the idea of a traditional tobacco company moving in this direction. As time goes on, hopefully less and less people are going to be smoking and taking up smoking, which is going to erode obviously into the revenues of all these companies. A lot of these style of companies seem to have only been able to maintain and grow their revenues because they're increasing product price rather than the products being used, which while it's a good thing that less people are smoking, from a shareholder standpoint, we need the money. So it's a double-edged sword to a degree, but it is nice to see them moving into an alternate market to potentially grow their revenue. I'm not going to count the slight increase in smoking average over the COVID period because I can't see that being a common thing every couple of years or at least hopefully not a common thing over the next couple of years. British American Tobacco already do have some CBD products in their line under their Vuce brand and this purchase is another step in that direction. I assume that they hope that the market will continue to open up across the US and potentially further. The deal cost them around 175 million for the purchase of all of the shares, which for British American Tobacco is not a lot as the company had around 3.7 billion pounds in free cash and available cash to spend at the end of 2020. It is projected that recreational use of cannabis in the USA is likely to grow from around 7.4 billion up to around 25 billion in 2025, which is a CAGR of around 23%. This is a small amount compared to the current traditional cigarette market, which sits at around $818 billion. And what we have to remember is that there is a chance that other countries could open up to cannabis sales, potentially the UK. And if that happens, it will be an advantage for companies that already have a supply chain into that country if they can then move cannabis quickly into the market. But that's it for the articles. And before I pop over to my trading two on two ISA, I just wanted to ask if these are stories that you'd seen before, stories you already knew about, or if anything was interesting to you and if you had any thoughts. If you would be able to hit the like button, if you found any of this useful, I would greatly appreciate it. And if you fancy sharing it to someone that might be interested, that would also help. But let's move over to Trading212 and see what's happened over the last week. Looking at the portfolio as normal, we'll start with the value change and also the return change. So last week I ended with a value of £2,589 with a return of 11.75%, which is around £272 in real money terms. This overall value did grow to £2,640, but I did see a drop in the actual return by 0.30%, so down to about 11.45%, which in real money terms is around £271 in gains. So I'm not particularly fussed about that. There was no real movement by the end of the week and through changes in the week, the portfolio went from around 12% down to about 10%. So despite all this, I still believe there are some valued companies that I can still pick up. Talking of value, let's move over to purchases. So in regards to purchases, I did only make two in the last week. These both took place on the 31st of March, with the first one being two shares of AXA for a total of £39.38, which brings my AXA position to four shares. I then also picked up one more share of GSK for £13, which brings my total GSK position to eight shares. I'm not 100% sure why GSK is so low at the moment. I've had a look at their finances and their figures and they look pretty strong. They're generally better than most of the competitors and are currently growing. So I feel that there's a lot of scope in the share price to grow for the company. And that's not even including the 80 pence yearly dividend on average that they pay out. So let me know what you think down in the description below. Is this a stock that I've completely misread? A stock that you're interested in? Or would you like me to do potentially a video around evaluating GSK? But I probably will be picking up some more stocks of GSK if the price stays as low as it is. The dividends for last week started with Home Depot on the 29th and they paid out a penny for the 0.01 of a share that I hold. Then on the same day, we had Kraft Heinz who sent over 52 pence for holding 2.1 shares. And ending that day, we had Bank of America who came in with a total of 33 pence for the three shares that I hold. Then we had some really, really, really annoying ones. So the first one that came in on the 1st of April was from BP. And they sent over a lovely 38 pence for the 10 shares that I currently hold. 
and then Pepsi chipped in on the 2nd of April with a 63 pence payment for holding the one share. If you're interested in why I'm so annoyed about two particular dividends, I would suggest you check out my last video, which is my monthly update. I'll add the link down in the description below for you, so feel free to check that out. But let's now have a quick look at what the worst performing stocks in my portfolio are over the last week. So currently my worst performing stock is Dominion Energy, where I'm down around £3.30, which is about 11%. It seems evenly spread across FX and also general value loss, so no particular one causing the other there. Following this, we had Hormel Foods and Walmart, with 10.18% loss and 10.26% loss respectively. Over the next few weeks, I will most likely be trying to pick up a few more shares of GSK and potentially a few more shares of AXA. I am also tempted by Disney, but they are still trading at a very high premium, even though they had a drop in March. So I'm not as confident on that one, even though I know they are a solid company. But putting that aside, rounding off the video, I wanted to again compare my portfolio return change to the change in the VUSA Vanguard ETF. For my portfolio, we know that it dropped 0.30% over the week. And looking at the ETF, it looks like the ETF actually moved up around a full percentage point. So this week I concede the ETF has beaten me. This is though the first week since I've been tracking this and doing it this way that that has happened. So I'm not overly concerned. It is just a fun measure that I can see how I'm doing. But let me know what you think. Is this something that I should be concerned about that I'm being beaten by an ETF? I'm not particularly concerned. I'm enjoying my investing journey. If you think anyone may be interested in any of this news or the slight portfolio update, please send it across to them, share it, let's see if we can get this out. I generally just want people to know that even with small amounts of money, you can invest and make profits. And as always, remember to invest, save and subscribe.